If I had one wish that I could wish this holiday season, it would be that all the children of the world to join hands and sing together in a spirit of harmony and peace. If I had two wishes that I could make this holiday season, the first would be for all the children of the world to join hands and sing in a spirit of harmony and peace. And the second would be for Henry Kissinger to die. Thank you, everybody. And very <laughs> We're just going to go make a podcast right now because it's time for an episode of Lucky Paper Radio. My name is Andy. Hello, dear listener. And I'm here as always with my co-host, Anthony, White Mane Lion plus Soketra's Monument is a combo Maddox. It's the only combo that was in my cube for a long time and even that is now gone. Why is it gone? Because you told me to cut it. <laughs> I mean, I this told you to cut it for a long record. time, but that's... Well, no, that's not. Why did you not start listening? True. That's to not me. quite true. We also had a particular. You and I had a particular match where I had the combo online, and it was not necessarily the most fun game of Magic for either of us, especially just because it was like I had not White Mane Lion, but Stone Cloaker, which could interact with your graveyard, and you walked right into it, knowing what was happening, and you were just like, "I'm done with this." It was not <laughs> which, fun. Fair. I do remember that. Counterpoint, I was making lots of tokens and having a blast, sort of. It's funny, because White Mane Lion plus Okedra's Monument is actually, like, pretty good. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of attention paid to combos that make it to Constructed. And if a combo does not make it to Constructed, I think it's, like, relegated to this arena of, like, janky combo. But truly, when it really comes down to it, like, that combo is not that much different than Thopter Sword. In terms of like what it generates, sure, one mana for a one one with vigilance. Yeah, as opposed to Thopter Sword, which is one mana for a one one with flying and gain a life. That I think. is a lot better, but I mean, is in the spectrum of, of things you can do in Magic: The Gathering. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense that obviously the pieces of Thopter Sword are better in isolation. It's maybe and a little bit more difficult to interact with as well. It's a tiny bit more difficult to interact with because you can't destroy the sword. You can always just destroy the foundry. But you can also interact with the Monument Lion with a shock. Any creature removal in instant speed will also disrupt the combo. Yes. Thopter Sword does not get disrupted by creature removal. Yeah, just, it's obviously worse, which is why no sure. one's ever played Oketris Monument, White Mane Lion, or similar in a constructed format, at least to my knowledge. I think it had some fringe playability at some point when Monument first came out, maybe in like Pioneer or something. When Monument first came out, Pioneer didn't exist. Yeah. So that was weird, right? <laughs> <laughs> People were like, this is going to be something. <laughs> Anthony, we don't talk about combo a lot on this show, I we feel don't. like. Or I mean, people at least don't think we talk about combo that much. I'll be honest, it's not necessarily my favorite style of gameplay. Well, this episode's all about combo. Let's start there. Why is combo not your favorite style of gameplay? So, I'm a fan. I mean, my, my historically, the, the kind of magic that I've most been interested in is like limited magic, and my cube emulates a lot of things about limited magic, and a big part of that is just that all the games have a lot of give and take. There's just sort of a, a tempo to the games where people are gaining incremental advantage. Figuring out how to get your two-for-one is really important. That's the kind of stuff I really love, and I feel like combos often just end up invalidating a lot of the gameplay that came before them. If I'm playing this sort of fair incremental value game, that's my whole plan, and then you just play two cards that instantly win on the spot to me that's not always the most satisfying and maybe a lot of that obviously comes from the kind of magic that i experience you know we all have our own sort of personal narrative of what makes things fun and a lot of the places i've experienced combos is in commander where especially you have that feeling of like i've been building up my strategy my i got a hundred cards over yeah. here yeah and then I somebody just else this whole pile does a combo and it's like uh, okay, I guess we're done. I guess no, nothing that I did here mattered. And that was honestly a big part of my personal magic history was just not finding that kind of experience. And there are other things about Commander that created that same feeling of invalidating all of my decisions and invalidating my game plan that I really just sort of drew me to wanting to get a lot more interested in Limited and then getting into Cube with a similar just sort of aesthetic and taste. Look, if I take infinite turns in my old border Urza EDH deck with Mystic Sanctuary, Trade Routes, and Time Warp. 
You should you should just stop that. That's not that good. Yeah, I mean, but simply have a disenchant. Here's the thing: or a grave hate piece, like we often say, or a counterspell. It's really all about setting expectations. If mm-hmm. I'm thinking about, hey, I'm going to play a dozen games, and I know that you have a combo. I'm still making meaningful decisions if I know that what I'm trying to do is maximize my chance of being able to finish this game before you get there. And I'm like tracking well, how much mana you have and how much mana your combo takes and do, what kind of disruption do I do I have. There's plenty of ways to still make that a meaningful experience, obviously, and a lot of people really enjoy combos, which is why I'm just framing this in sort of my personal narrative, because that's that's what matters to my experience, but isn't everybody's experience. Yeah, I, mean, I agree with you, and I have a lot of notes here about combos, specifically as it pertains to cube design, and I will re-emphasize a lot of those points you just made. But what you just described is a argument against having a combo here or there in an otherwise fair environment, but it seems like you also don't enjoy environments where the expectation is everyone's going to combo. Yeah, Am I talking about the Degenerate Microcube? Yes, I'm talking about the Degenerate Microcube, which you notoriously loathe. That is a very different thing, and on one hand, it is talking about expectations, a much more reasonable context where you're like, yeah, I know everybody's going to be trying to do these combos. That's what this experience is about. So that, in theory, mitigates that particular issue. But there is another aspect to it, which is that I think that a lot of combos take a very specific knowledge of the way that cards work and the way that the combos work. So if I'm playing this sort of very extremely fair side of the spectrum of magic, I can look at a card and be like, okay, well, this is a creature, it has stats, the stats are a little bit above or below rate, it has uh, an ability, let's figure out how does that ability stack up and how does that adjust the quality of this card, the power of this card for me to put it in my deck or not. But you don't have to know that Chromatic Star's ability is a mana ability, and as such, doesn't use the stack, so blah, 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 blah. Or even I don't have to look at Kiki Jiki and say okay, well, this is meaningful with these four other cards that I probably would not puzzle that out if I'm just looking at a random pack of magic cards. I know that some very skilled players can just identify combos off the cuff, but I'm definitely not one of them. So there's both the intimate knowledge of how does this combo work and what are the other cards in this environment and how many are there that sort of inform how risky this is. And like we were talking about the interaction, how strong is this combo? How how resistant is this particular combo to what types of interaction are in the environment? All of that is super important to figuring out how to make an effective game plan in those kinds of environments. And I'm much more interested in just sort of rocking up to a new cube without a lot of context and just trying to figure it out as I go. And that really does not get rewarded in a really combo-heavy environment. Yeah, but you don't... You play the regular cube all the time. You're not rocking up to that without that context. You know everything about the regular cube, but it's still I mean, fun you for you. you say that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's interesting. I, I do think I have seen you really enjoy combos maybe more than you're willing to admit. Specifically, okay, tell I'm me thinking more. Because, about because Farmstead you've see, you've Gleaner. Seen me, in you've the, seen me uh, cast a, a tooth and nail and get Avacyn and, what is it, the archetype of endurance? The, the creature that gives everything hexproof and just be like, nope, I know what people are supposed to do with tooth and nail, but I'm just going to make myself safe here. I'm just thinking of you with Farmstead. <laughs> Stead Gleaner in the Turbo Cube and the big eating grid on your face. Sure. I mean, that is the other side to it is that it is fun when these come, things come together. And I think it's especially fun when it is a little bit of a surprise. Like those kinds of moments where this is kind of a synergistic interaction, like these pieces work on their own. And every once in a while, you get this story moment of, I get to machine gun you with my my scarecrow that has an infinite arrows combo and is going to grow in size. I mean, that's just kind of fun to picture what that would look like anyway. You got so, a big, yeah, you got I a big mean, grin in your face right now. I think you like combos. It's fun to it's fun to be the one comboing. <laughs> that's, that's all what it comes down to. You like to combo people. You don't like to be comboed. But even then, I mean, that's fun every once in a while. But that only happened in that particular draft, maybe twice out of you know six to nine games, and. All those cards still did stuff in other matches, but yeah, I mean, sure. Who doesn't like to combo? It can be fun, for sure. I want to like treat this as a fairly holistic conversation around combo. This kind of fits into our very long series of episodes. We've done one about aggro very early in the show's existence. We did one more recently about control, and we got a question about how combo fits into our sort of grand unifying theory of magic design and cube design, and... Spoiler alert, I don't really think it does fit in in the way that people want it to. I don't think it's like an elegant, here's how it relates to everything, because I think combo is fundamentally very different from the other types of macro archetypes we've discussed on the show before. But let's start just by defining what the heck a combo is. Do do you have a good definition for a combo? I don't. I mean, there's so much discussion about these kinds of semantic issues of how do we define things, and I feel like a lot of this discussion people really enjoy. I'm not always enjoying those conversations the most. I think it really comes down to coming up with a definition that is practical. And 
I would say it is it is multiple cards that come together to have a dramatic impact on the game and potentially threaten an immediate win on their own. Yeah, I mean, to me, I think it's important to note that I think whether something is a combo or not is a, whole, a huge continuum. And it's basically a continuum yeah. from cards that actually have no interaction with one another at all. Two bears. Two bears, which even then they can kind of double block. But still, basically, like, you know, two bears pretty much have <laughs> as little interaction with one another as cards can have in the game of Magic the Gathering. Or, you know, uh, a bear and a trade routes. Like, what do those cards do together? Nothing. They're just two cards that exist in the same deck. That's one side. And then the other side is like, yeah, two cards that immediately win the game, right? It does not matter what has happened at all. And the Splinter Twin, I think, we'll keep coming back to mm-hmm. as like one of the most iconic and beloved combo decks in the history of Constructed Magic and well known in Cube Circles, too, because it's a combo that features very prominently in a lot of vintage and otherwise powerful cubes. Where right. So Splinter Twin is an enchantment that you can put on your creature and it gives the creature tap to make a copy of that creature and then you exile at the beginning of the next end steps. So the idea uh, if you were what just end step? <laughs> if you were just reading this card fairly is, oh cool, now like every turn I get to duplicate an ETB effect or attack with something that attack with impunity. Attack with impunity it, because yeah. my creature isn't gonna die in combat because it was just this copy which is honestly a pretty cool design for a card but if you combine it with something like pestermite that's a creature that when it enters the battlefield you untap something that means you cast your pestermite because it has flash on your opponent's end step put a splinter twin on it and then machine gun out as many little pestermites as you want and win on the spot yeah that to me is the other end of the spectrum and i think everything in between is thopter sword oketra's monument white main lion all the way down to like any kind of mildly synergistic cards, right? Like uh, Dreadhorde Arcanist and a Giant Growth. Like, that's on this combo continuum. And I don't think there's any really hard lines anywhere, except with the one exception of maybe, like, maybe there's a little bit of a hard line at the game is over and a win happens immediately on the spot, all the way at the, like, far extreme end of that spectrum. So maybe a little bit of an air gap there between, like, what is super close to that but not quite that. Maybe you count, like, Dark Depths as super close to not quite that because it'll end the game most of the time, but what if they have a flyer or 21 life instead of 20 sure, life? Sure, and I mean, Splinter Twin is also something that you can disrupt, so it's not that combos are always well, guaranteed yeah, they're win. always disruption. But this is assuming that the combo gets to happen, right? Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, they could just have uh, played the one ring last turn and now mm-hmm. you go off and it doesn't even matter so i think it's a big continuum and i think that's like fundamentally different from at least how we've defined something like an aggro deck or a control deck or a mid-range deck we haven't actually done mid-range decks that'll be probably the last one we do in this series but you know we defined an aggro deck in that episode all those years ago as a deck that is trying to go faster than all of its opponents mm-hmm. right that's not really a spectrum obviously what the aggro deck looks like can be a spectrum right depending on the environment and you can have decks that are more or less aggressive but by definition, your deck is trying to go under all of your opponents and get them dead before they can cast all of their spells and realize all the value of their cards. And we've contextualized a control deck as the polar opposite, a deck that is trying to go to the long game as much as possible, trying to answer all of its opponent's threats and win with some form of card advantage, be it virtual or literal. And that's your like fundamental strategy of your deck when you're drafting the like capital A aggro and the capital C control decks in any environment. I so often see people want to fit a combo deck into this rock, paper, scissors of aggro, mid-range, and control. Like, where does combo fit in? And it's something I've thought about a lot over the years. And I, for me, I've just come to the conclusion that I don't think it fits in at all. I don't think a combo deck is a combo deck in the same way that an aggro deck is an aggro deck or a mid-range deck is a mid-range deck because what constitutes a combo deck is so much more broad-ranged than what the decks can actually look like. The difference between a Splinter Twin deck and a Storm deck or a Cart Clan Ironworks deck, or a Bomberman combo deck, or Cephalid Breakfast, or whatever, these decks are all totally different. Like right. The only thing they share is that they have a win condition that is far enough along this combo spectrum that people feel comfortable calling it a combo. That's the only... like A combo is really more of a win condition than it is a strategy, I think, fundamentally. And different types of combos slot into different types of shells, right? Like... The Splinter Twin deck is actually mostly a control deck. It's got a lot of permission, a lot of counter magic. The idea being that at some point, your opponent's going to tap out for a threat. You can either choose to answer it if you have to, or if that threat doesn't matter because you can just pester my Splinter Twin, you just you always have that instant speed pester my receiver X arc to decide on your opponent's turn if you're going to go for your combo now. And the nature of that combo just fits so nicely into a control shell that it's basically a control deck with the combo win. As yeah, a- those are actually exactly the two examples that I was thinking to use is Splinter Twin and Storm, because Splinter Twin, especially if you're drafting in a cube, often you only have a couple copies of these particular cards. Maybe you only have one copy of each side of the combo in your deck at all, and 
that works really fine if you're just playing a control deck and saying, I will win eventually if I can just resolve this. So the rest of my plan is just prevent my opponent from winning and prevent my opponent from having disruption for that. So it, it really is a control deck that has a win condition that could be substituted in for anything else. And Storm, on the other hand, in some ways you could almost think of it as an aggro deck in the sense that it has the same kind of strategy of I want to invalidate my opponent's strategy, invalidate my opponent's cards by just winning before they can really do anything. And I think a lot of combos play out that way where they're just trying to invalidate by being faster. Yeah, and very importantly, I think almost no storm deck can fit a meaningful amount of interaction. Like the nature of a storm right. deck is your whole deck has to have this velocity of positive mana, positive cards, so that you can eventually just connect enough spells together, string enough spells together to have a high enough storm count to win. And you don't have room in that deck for counter spells most of the time or like ways to actually stop your opponent because the whole point is you're not supposed to care about what your opponent is doing right like as long as you get to turn three or four without being dead it doesn't matter what they did they could have gotten you to one they could have a board of enormous creatures like it's all completely irrelevant because you just win on the spot with your storm deck so i agree i think that's kind of like an aggro combo deck in some ways i think we could even throw infect on that side of the spectrum where it is very much a combo deck it's not about generating card advantage it's it's really willing to just spend all of its resources to get you dead right away that's interesting because i don't think most people would call infect a combo deck but it's definitely on the spectrum right yeah. and i think they probably wouldn't call it that because it's not any two cards specifically right it's not like you have to combine kiki jiki and splinter twin you just have to combine a threat with infect and enough pump spells. Invigorate. And, right. Or become immense or whatever. I was just going to say that I've seen discourse in the past around whether burn is a combo or an aggro deck. And people will go to the mat being like, it's an aggro deck or it's a combo deck. And you can certainly see arguments on both sides, right? Like, it is a combo deck in the sense that it doesn't care about the board whatsoever, right? You are just always pointing burn at your opponent's face. You are just trying to count to 20. That's your whole goal. Mm -hmm. And you let them do whatever they want with their creatures along the way most of the time. But other people would say it's an aggro deck simply because it's got burn spells and gets your opponent dead quickly, right? And These I, terms are neither comprehensive nor mutually exclusive. Right. And, and that's like a control version of a combo deck, and there's aggro versions of combo decks. There's also definitely mid-range versions of combo decks. I think in Cube specifically, we most often see this with like Persist Combo, where you're sure. basically like a green-white or maybe green-black or Abzan creature deck that can just play creatures and attack your opponent that sometimes you get to go off with Persist. In Constructed, this looks more like a... You, there's also Persist combo historically in Constructed, like Malyra Pod was basically a Persist combo deck. There's also Food Chain combo, which is basically a mid-range deck that can go off with Food Chain and a Mist Hollow Griffin. And so you can also just have a combo win condition in an otherwise mid-range deck. So there is no one relationship to tempo and value that you can describe a combo deck as having. And so it, I truly think that if you're looking at this like unified theory of magic decks that you have this one side which is like the side of heuristics the, the side of caring about tempo and card advantage the like fair side of the spectrum where aggro mid range and control live and then you have combo and combo is a totally different thing and it's almost like i can picture it as like a it's like another dimension right like you have the dimensions of how they relate to tempo and value and then you have this like third dimension of how it relates to combo which how many dimensions can we add to our unified theory of magic? Well, I, th I think ultimately it's like it's not productive to do this other than like as a funny thought experiment mm -hmm. of like, you know, what does this actually look like? Because you could like expound on this unified theory and then like what's the result? You're like, okay, now I kind of have a picture of what magic decks could look like, but it doesn't inform any direct play, which is what everyone wants from their sure. like magic theory. I, mean, so. I think there are some important things in there that we can draw value from. Like you mentioned, a more mid-rangey combo deck. And I think that makes sense in the context of having a bunch of cards that have reasonably high floors on their own. So I can just play these cards that interact in a normal way and then also sometimes just have this really fast win with a combo. Whereas something like a Splinter Twin combo in a high-powered cube, Pestermite is essentially just not a card. It just does nothing on its own unless you have the combo. And so that just makes a lot more sense that that's, that card doesn't do anything unless you're going to do it. Even more Splinter Twin, I think, doesn't do anything sure, on its own sure. in that context. But yeah. So I think that that is a meaningful lesson of just thinking about what is the floor of my components and does that fit into a shell that has to be all in or can it be a little bit more focusing on multiple different axes, axes and multiple potential ways to win the game. Another little wrinkle just to just to be clear about is a lot of the things that are most obviously combos are just things that are arbitrary loops. You can just play Splinter Twin and Pestermite and do this as many times as you want and that is 
magical. That's breaking the laws of physics, but in magic you can do that. And some of these things on the less obviously combo side of the spectrum, they just need to get to 20 life, you know? Or maybe it's Storm, which is somewhere in between, where it's not actually a loop, but they can do things pretty much indefinitely if they can get into the right situation. So that's another sort of maybe more aesthetic point than anything else, but I think definitely informs what people categorize as combos. Yeah. So another way, I think, to conceptualize this third axis, this combo axis, is whether or not these abstract heuristics matter, right? Like tempo card advantage, that kind of stuff. Or whether or not specific cards matter. And this is the way I've described the Degenerate Microcube in the past, which is a fully dedicated combo environment. Every deck in that cube is a combo deck or is designed to beat a variety of combo decks. Like it is a hate bearers style deck that is just trying to stop its opponent's combo because it the expectation, the context, the meta of that environment is everyone's playing combos or trying to stop them. And in that environment, truly, I don't think that you can describe almost anything that matters as tempo or card advantage, right? Uh, like Ancestral Recall is in that cube and it's obviously good. But it's nowhere near as good as a lot of people first think when they start playing that cube because they're like, well, Ancestral Recall is broken. Like, you have it in a cube next to, like, Brainstorm, and it's a zillion times better than Brainstorm. And yeah, it is. But actually, weirdly, in that cube, hiding cards from discard spells is extremely relevant in a lot of matchups. But we're not going to talk about whether or not Ancestral Recall is strictly better than Brainstorm on this episode. But my, my point is that people... <laughs> that's a conversation that's never been suggested. <laughs> my point is that people have this learned heuristic of like card advantage is good and ancestral recall represents an obscene amount of card advantage for the mana invested which it absolutely does but in that environment what ancestral recall does most of the time is gives you more blue cards to discard to your free counter spells or finds your free counter spells that's what it does it does not matter that you have additional cards in hand it matters that you have the specific cards in hand you need at the moment you need them and the card is fine there. It's not great. Similarly, like tempo is also kind of just not a thing. Like the aggro decks don't win because they kill their opponent before they can do their thing. The only decks in that cube that kill your opponent before they can do their thing are the fastest combo decks if they're like a turn or two faster than their opposing combo decks. The decks that play small creatures that you would otherwise think are aggro creatures, like your Athalia Guardian of Thraben, they win just by stopping your opponent from getting to do their thing, by locking them out, basically, with, like, hate pieces. Yeah, there are some weird quirks to this environment. I mean, so this is... You're playing with 15-card decks, you don't lose to decking, but really it just comes down to how do your threats line up against your opponent's threats and answers. And the fact that you might only have three lands in your deck or four lands in your deck, so you might just literally be priced out of casting your spells if your opponent has one or two tax effects, I think really matters. And and related to sort of the card advantage, again, you're going to draw most of your deck in most games, so it doesn't really matter as much exactly when you're drawing it. Yeah, precisely. So I think at the extreme ends of what a combo environment looks like or a combo deck looks like, like you said, you mentioned this when I said, why don't you like combo decks? And you're like, well, it just invalidates all of my decisions prior in the game. And it does. At the extreme ends, nothing about the abstract interactions between cards and this like thought technology that Magic players have invented to understand the game on a meta level, tempo, card advantage, whatever, that all is completely irrelevant. All that matters is, here's my combo. Do you have a removal spell or a counter spell right now? Otherwise, you lose. When it comes to cube design, I think it's really interesting to think about how that kind of relates to fairer decks, because I think the Degenerate Microcube is a really extreme example, right? Really? You think that's extreme? It's a really extreme example. It's a, it's a much smaller cube, and you draft it entirely, and you make these tiny little decks, and so there really is nothing resembling a fair deck in that environment. Again, the fair decks all have to stop fast combo decks, and then it can just win with a ham sandwich, so they're kind of like a weird version of control. There's tons of cubes and cube designers out there that are trying to weave some element of combo which is to some degree fundamentally fun i've seen the grin on your face when you go up with farmstead gleaner like people are chasing that in their cube to some degree people might just have a lot of affection for a splinter twin they used to play in modern back when it was legal i should say before anybody writes in farmstead gleaner combo only works in the context of the turbo cube where you have a discount <laughs> on all your effects which is a separate topic <laughs> it's a cool combo in that cube it's it's fun to kill your opponent with a scarecrow Anyway, I think people are often trying to figure out how these things should relate to one another. And some people that listen to the show have made the assumption that I hate combo or dislike combo because I explicitly avoid it at all costs in my own Bun Magic Guild, which is the environment I spend most of my time designing, talking about in this show and thinking about because it's like my encapsulation of the kind of magic I most want to play in a draft. And it's not that I don't like combo, right? Like my other two cubes are the Degenerate Micro Cube, which is nothing but combos. And the Neoclassical Cube, which we'll get to, because that cube also has, I think, a bunch of combo and combo-adjacent decks in it, 
And that is an environment where I'm trying to balance that with the presence of more fair decks and trying to figure out what that looks like. But specifically in the Bun Magic Cube, I have avoided it because I don't want to ever be in a place where I'm invalidating those decisions. I want you to have to care about tempo and card advantage so much in that cube that I don't really want any opportunities to invalidate those decisions that are made early in the game based on those heuristics. A a dumb example of this is that I've gotten questions as to why I don't include, like, Troll of Khazad Doom, the one-mana Swamp Cycler from Lord of the Rings in my cube, because that's a great card. It's seeing Legacy play. It's great to just have a non-basic land cycler. You can go get a Swamp-type land, and then you have the ceiling of this big, giant creature you can put into play. And the answer is because I include Reanimate in my cube because I really like playing a quote-unquote fair Reanimate, right? And I think if I put Troll of Khazad Doom in the cube, then there is a combo, a reanimator combo, where you can turn one, discard your Troll of Khazad Doom, go get a Swamp, turn two, reanimate it, and now you have a creature that is totally unfair for the tempo of the game. You should not have a creature that big with two lands in play based on the costing of cards in Magic's history, right? And uh, you could write in about, yeah, it's late in the game, you only have two lands and you play Murktide Region or whatever. Yeah, sure, but... You love to do that. But, but that's something you have to work for, right? Like, I feel like you have, you have earned that in a way that you have actually made concessions to the tempo and the card advantage of the environment to actually get to a place where you can do that. Whereas there's no concessions to be made to cycling your troll and then reanimating it. That's just something you get to do sometimes. So I have to exclude cards from my cube that otherwise would be good fits explicitly because I want to include reanimate and I don't want there to be anything that resembles a combo in that environment. Which bears mentioning that I think... Reanimator is a deck that I so often see in cubes that otherwise include no combo. And I think there's a couple reasons why we see that often. The biggest one is just that I think more than any other of the combos we've mentioned, the reanimator pieces tend to be mostly generically playable, right? Like their discard outlets are great in madness decks or decks with a lot of flashback or decks with other graveyard themes. And oftentimes the creatures you want to reanimate will overlap with your ramp targets, right? It'll either be a big green creature that you can ramp into in the green deck in the mid or late game, or it's something you can reanimate early. So for all those reasons, I think we see reanimator in a lot of cubes that don't have other combos, but I think designers should be honest with themselves and admit that that is fully a combo. Like it is a combo to put a grizzle band into play on turn three. You should not (laughs) <laughs> That's not, it's not a fair thing to do in a game of Magic, then it totally changes the texture from how are you navigating tempo, how are you navigating card advantage, to do you have an answer? Like, now you need to answer on a on the card axis, not on the heuristics axis, to have the game continue, right? And I think a lot of people get it in their heads that, like, it is normal and fits in the environment, because sometimes you do have an answer. You have the source of plowshares in your mono-white aggro deck, and even though your tempo of playing a couple one-drops on turn one now doesn't really matter, because your opponent has a grizzle brand, you just get to exile it and then resume the fair game, right? You get to basically have the answer that takes us out of that combo cards matter axis and back into the tempo and value matters axis. And I think that's a tricky thing to navigate. I feel like I'm, I'm just blabbering on now, but how do you feel about reanimator in cubes that are otherwise fair? I agree with everything you're saying. I do think that the sort of like texture of the kinds of interaction that can matter there feels more within bounds. So if I am playing an aggro deck and I have removal spells because I want to clear the way for my attackers, that interaction is also going to work against reanimation of one big threat where it might not work at all against Storm or against a Splinter Twin if it's sorcery speed or whatever. So just the fact that it does have a little bit more of a forgiving nature in some contexts, I think makes it feel more reasonable. Yeah. And again, it's also all about expectations. If people are like, yeah, Reanimator is a thing I'm used to, and it's a thing I expect to happen, whereas Storm is this weird, complicated thing that just takes a ton of support and a ton of specific cards, that's just going to affect the way people think about it and the way people are excited to put it in the cube or not. Yeah, it's also where those things exist on that axis, right? Like, most of the time, if your opponent gets to reanimate something and swing with it once or twice, the game is over, but yeah. it's very rarely literally over. It's like, okay... They got three triggers off their Archon of Cruelty. I'm a mile behind, but now I did finally find the answer. Can I possibly crawl out of this hole? As opposed to, yes, yeah, Splinter Twin, now the game is over. doesn't matter what happened you know, at all prior to this. So it's somewhere on that axis, right? And again, I don't think it's particularly useful to like spend a bunch of time litigating whether or not a thing crosses over into like a combo or just a synergy. But just to recognize how much you want your player's decisions to be about tempo, card advantage onboard heuristics of, you know, should I trade in combat? Should I not? Like, using my life total as a resource. Like, 
all of these questions are all one arena of questions. And another arena of questions is, did I draft the specific answers I need for the specific kinds of things I'm going to see that otherwise invalidate that set of decisions? And as a cube designer, you get to decide how much you want that to be a thing. And in my own bun magic cube, I want almost all the attention to be on the former, right? I want everyone to have to think about how to use the removal spells in a like value tempo oriented way, not thinking, well, I have to hold a removal spell because my opponent might have a combo. And then if I have used my removal to try and generate some abstract advantage before that combo happens, then I just lose when I don't have the removal spell and they, tr and they try and go for their combo. So I don't want that to be present in that particular environment. Yeah, that's a really good point about sort of the way that combos affect gameplay. It's not just about you will have games where a player does a combo and that ends the game and it potentially, you know, makes a player feel like their decisions were invalidated, all that stuff we talked about. It also affects the other games where maybe combos don't even happen, where it's like, well, if uh, I was just playing it's a fair deck, I would use my removal here because it generates a certain amount of advantage, but... I'm playing against a deck that I know has a combo in it, so I'm going to just have to hold on to this removal spell, and that's going to affect the way the games play, and that might be interesting to you. It also might not be that interesting to you and actually feel like you're cutting off some potential play because you're just thinking, well, I can't use my removal spell, and that also means I can't attack here, so we're kind of at a stalemate to see, can I actually navigate dealing with this threat when it comes up? Yeah, I had a recent draft of our friend Julian's Legacy Cube, where I felt this tension. That's an environment that is largely fair, but has a few combos. And this is a roto draft, so the combo decks, you know, were functional. They had all the pieces mm -hmm. they needed. And there was a lot of situations where it was like, I for sure win a game here if I just keep curving out and my opponent does not happen to have drawn their combo pieces, right? And so a big part of me is like, well, I should just simply curve out and keep winning this game because my cards are better. I'm ahead on board. They're on a two or three turn clock or whatever. But I also knew that if they do have the combo and I continue to curve out, then I am tapped out and don't have removal for the Eternal Witness when they go to loop Ephemerate Eternal Witness and time warp and just take infinite turns. And in that particular context, I definitely found that to be not the most fun. It was like, okay, so now I have to basically just like flip a coin and like do the math and think, what are the chances they have this or don't have it? And that decides my decision making. And there's, there's certainly a lot of texture to that, right? Like, you can look at what your opponent has done on previous turns to determine how likely they are to have it, like using their actions as information to help you figure out what's going on in their mind and their game plan. But it just felt like I was like, all right, well, I'm either going to like make myself at the mercy of maybe them having drawn this combo, or I'm going to hold up interaction for it. And if I hold up interaction for it for the next five turns, maybe they just catch up in the fair game and yeah. now I'm no longer ahead anymore. And I think that's like the tension that people have to think about when they are trying to make combo fit in an environment that has otherwise a foundation of like fair magic going on. The other one being the thing you mentioned, which is just how interactable are the combos with the otherwise fair cards, right? Like reanimator, as long as you don't have hex proof or indestructible reanimation targets is also just answerable by any amount of creature removal theoretically in your cube, which means that it does in that spectrum fall more in the middle as, as opposed to all the way on the combo end. Do you think it also matters how much you're going to play either a particular match or maybe even just a whole environment altogether where you're describing the situation where you have to sort of make this statistical guess to figure out, should I keep curving out or should I keep up my interaction? That to me is maybe not super fun if it is one game, but if I know I'm going to play a dozen, two dozen games of a particular match... I'm going to actually start seeing that payoff. Like, I'll see, oh, am I making this call correctly over the course of multiple games? Whereas in any instance, it's going to be just a binary. So does it actually, do these kinds of things get more fun just the more you're playing? I think it's a different kind of fun. I think that's a lot of the fun that comes from playing with combo and constructed metas, where it's like, yes, there if you're playing your fair constructed deck against a known combo deck in the meta, and I see like Brian Koval on the Bosch and Roll YouTube channel do this all the time, just like try and figure out what their opponent is trying to do based on their like first non-basic land and like oh that's the kind of non-basic land you would run in a combo deck and so i need to make sure i hold this thing up instead of mm, like trying to curve combo out land yeah i mean like that i think can be a very interesting type of fun and there it's because you get to lean on the heuristics of all of the like known all the collective knowledge of all the times that matchup has been played in this constructed meta previously right you get to know like here's what i do when i'm playing against cephalid breakfast and i'm delver right like here's what i have to like here's what my strategy is like broadly speaking whereas 
yeah, in a in a cube, you're not ever playing decks that are so prescriptive because you just drafted them. They're unique. It's, a, mm-hmm. it's the only time anyone's ever put those 40 cards together and your opponent's also playing 40 cards. It's the only time it's ever been put together in this cube. And so it's, it's more of a shot in the dark. You're more just like, you know, throwing a Hail Mary and seeing what happens as opposed to being able to actually say, no, I know here from talking about this and like having conversations about theory in the community that like this is how I'm supposed to play this matchup. Yeah. It's fun to figure that out. It's fun to like have a puzzle that is concrete that you get to solve collectively and then take your solution out into the wild and know that sometimes your solution, you know, 40% of the time you're going to lose anyway and that's okay. It's definitely much less fun for me at least when it's like, well, I don't know yeah. what the numbers are because we just drafted these decks and who's to know. And I should say like it's a different kind of fun because fundamentally that's why I like Cube is because you don't know. Like I most of the time prefer not knowing. I don't want to have to do all that homework of the meta. But that really applies mostly to fair decks where it's like I don't want to have to like know what my opponent's going to have and like try and play this like next level. You get some like time to react to things over the course of a couple turns. Well, you, you get to play to those abstract heuristics. You get to like make smart and savvy tempo and card advantage plays which play around this bell curve of what your opponent might have, right? You're like, oh, they could have a three drop, a four drop, or a five drop on this turn, and, you know, this is the range of what three drops, four drops, and five drops can do in this environment on power level, and you can, like, play to those, to that bell curve of outcomes in a way that I think is very satisfying when you have that bell curve, and then there's one point off far far to the right that's just, oh, now they win because uh, they have this one card, and forget the bell curve. It doesn't matter how much mana was spent on it. Like, forget all that stuff. They just had the one card. That's where I think it does get much less fun in a singleton yeah. like one-off drafted context. And in this particular Roto draft, I thought I had a very good matchup against one combo deck, the aforementioned Ephemerate Eternal Witness Time Warp deck. And I had a very frustrating match because I played one game where I chose to curve out. I was way ahead. I mean, my deck was just much better in terms of like the threat density and like what the curve looked like because I wasn't trying to support this like clunky combo, right? I didn't have dead cards. My deck was just like a lean, mean, mid-range deck. And so I had one game where I like curved out, put up an entire giant board, was, like, way ahead, and then just, like, lost to the combo right before I was going to win the next turn because I chose to curve out instead of hold up interaction. Bad choice. And I was like, well, okay, that sucks. And then the next game, I had interaction, and I chose to hold up the entire time, and what happened is the game got drawn out, and if I had curved out, I could have won, but instead it got drawn out, drawn out, drawn out, and eventually my opponent didn't go infinite, but they used the stupid Kiora or Tamio, no, Tamio, some stupid Tamio that... You name cards from the top of your the library. Green, green, blue one. Yeah, you can get stuff. They ended up taking like four or five turns consecutively without going infinite because I just gave them enough time to like put together enough regrowth effects and time warp. They didn't have the ephemerate, but they had the eternal witness to get back time warp once. They had Tamio to get it back again. And then over those two turns, they ticked up Tamio and got it back again one more time. And it was like that only happened because I chose not to curve out and hold up interaction, but the interaction didn't matter because they weren't actually going infinite. They just did this thing enough times for value. And it was just a hugely frustrating match because were they having fun though? They did have fun and I was trying my best to have fun for them, but you know, it's a roto draft. So I thought about all these matchups in great detail. And I was like, I think I'm favorite here. Like I think my deck can win this matchup. And I still think that I think that these were two games where I had to make that choice, that coin flip choice. And I decided wrong in both directions, right? The first time I was like, I think overall I'm supposed to do this this way. This is my abstract heuristic. And then after I lost because of that, I was burned and just flipped to the other side. And I was like, well, I'm not going to lose that, that way again. Was that just an emotional again. response or was that well, like, I don't was know what your else, heuristic correct the I, whole time? I, I don't know. That's the thing is maybe we can like crunch the numbers and figure out if my heuristic is correct. But like, well, I don't know. I don't think we'll ever know. So it's like, did I make the right decisions or not? I mean, obviously for how the games turned out, I made the wrong decisions in both cases, but I mean, that's results oriented thinking. You can't think that way. There's one of those is, yeah, directions such, is the such right a way to do. Core it. thing about magic is you can make the right choice and still lose. Yes. And I, so anyway, that was a frustrating match. But there was another combo deck when it comes to expectations in this particular pod that was a strip mine wasteland crucible of worlds like lock deck, and this was one of the nine decks in the pod. And I was just like, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna lose that one. It's fine. Like, yeah. I, I was like. <laughs> Like for my deck, which has, I think I had 14 Sometimes non-basic lands. Sometimes the optimal lands. solution is not a uh, 100% victory. <laughs> right. My deck had 14 non-basic lands, and I was like, I'm just not going to commit any picks or like attempt to try and win that matchup. Like Maybe they'll get totally mana screwed or flooded, and I get to win, maybe. Mm-hmm. But I was like, I'm not actually going to try and make any concessions to that. I did lose that match, and I felt totally fine about it, because I was like, this is whatever. So there's ranges of what this can be, right? And I would be maybe a little peeved off if it was a regular you know, Swiss draft, and I happened to run into the deck that I made no mm-hmm. concessions to try and beat, but it was a roto. I was playing every single other player, and I was like, I'll just accept one 
very bad matchup and just let that go. Anyway, what are we talking about? Combo? Combos. <laughs> I mean, maybe we should talk about how combos actually affect the draft. And we're talking a lot about gameplay, but when we have them in cubes, you also have to figure out how to draft them. Oh, I'm so glad you brought this up because I wanted to mention that we had Ryan Sachs on the show a while back. He mentioned something about Splinter Twin Combos specifically, which I thought was really interesting, which is that I think you had said something like, oh, I don't like to include combos like Splinter Twin because then every game just becomes about, you know, do you get to do Splinter Twin? It like makes the whole game all about itself and it just kind of removes a lot of the fun texture of the deck. And Ryan said something really interesting, which I think what you said is true. And also what Ryan said in response is true, which is that he loves including cards like that because the presence of one or two cards can completely change what the blue-red deck is doing in that context, which is also true, right? Like a blue-red deck that doesn't have Kiki Pestermite is completely wildly different than a blue-red deck that does have Kiki Pestermite. And being able to have individual cards that dramatically recontextualize your whole sure. deck is kind of it's like the whole thesis of his build around cube right like that is what he's going for there and i do think that a lot of the fun of combos in cube is in the draft and deck building portion and i mean ryan has said this himself he's like if i could just draft back to back and then never play any games that's what i want to do most and i think that's what the build around cube is built for because yeah playing nine matches where you're just going to try and kiki jeek every single time like there's a lot of diminishing returns on the fun to that i think but Drafting nine decks back to back where you're playing blue red every time, but you can do something like wildly different in every deck because sometimes you have Kiki Twin, sometimes you have an Emery Toolbox with a bunch of like cheap artifacts. Like the idea that you can have a deck that does wildly different things is really fun to draft and, and deck build. And I think that that is one of the most unmentioned differences of priorities of cube designers that accounts for the different opinions towards how combos work in cubes. That's a really great point. I think this honestly relates again to just how much you're playing and how frequently you're playing. If I'm playing Magic once a week, I'm doing one cube draft a week, it's kind of frustrating if I take half a combo and just never see the other half. But if I'm doing nine back-to-back drafts, I'm much more tolerant of having those kind of like extreme failures, those high Especially variance Especially if you're never moments. playing the games. <laughs> Especially because it's just like, yeah, I'm going to do this and it's going to come together five out of nine times and that'll be fun. Going back to something like the regular cube, which is probably the cube I've drafted the most, there I'm a little bit I like having some things like the O'Catcher's Monument combo, even though that's been cut because we just did it enough. But it was cool to be like, oh yeah, now I'm taking this and my green-white deck is doing something a little bit different than what the typical green-white deck does here. But if I'm coming to a brand new environment every week and I'm only drafting once a week, that kind of long tail of experiences of unique things that can happen is just a lot less meaningful and maybe it's just not going to outweigh the kind of negative experiences of trying to do things and failing or seeing combos on the other side of the table. Yeah. I mean, the regular cube is a great example because it's maybe my favorite cube to draft in our play group. And more and more as time has gone on, I've realized that like, this is just the kind of like games I want to play. Right. I mean, I love my own cube. It's my own cube. It's the cube I built. Right. That's my favorite cube in a sense, but compared to every other cube in our play group, if we're like sitting down for Tuesday night and regular cubes an option, I'm like, I kind of want to be in the regular wow. cube pod. Burn, burn on Ligma cube. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the pube. I'd oh, ra- no. I'd rather... oh, no. That's a uh, suggested name for <laughs> Allison's peasant cube. Thank you, Alex, for that. No, it's just uh, like the way you've really focused on the gameplay in mm-hmm. that cube is something that I really look forward to. And like, I want to play that kind of magic. Another great example of this is that the roto draft of Julian's Legacy cube that I've been talking about in this episode and another roto draft of your regular cube kind of overlapped. And so there was a couple of weeks where I had decks of both in my bag and I was like, I just want to play the regular cube. Like, don't let me play more games of this Legacy <laughs> cube. I just want to play regular cube games with my cool deck. But that said, I don't think I've ever had an experience of like, like you just don't draft the regular cube and go, look how cool and wild my deck is. Yeah, it's not. It's never. It's that's some, never the case. I've heard that from some people, and it gives me a warm, fuzzy feeling. I, I maybe they're just. I don't know. I like. I always end up with a deck where it's like, I yep, this is gonna like result in the kind of games yeah. that I want. But like, there's nothing to like show off here. If it's like novel and cool and weird, it's like yeah, these are all regular cards right. doing regular stuff, which. If you're looking at Ryan Sachs, who's constantly posting pictures of all the wild decks he's drafted to the Builder Round Cube on Twitter, like that's not going to satisfy the kind of cube experience that Ryan Sachs wants to have because he's aiming for a totally different 
he's focusing his like creative energy on a different part of the experience of right. drafting and gameplay. I think also just it comes with having a lot more experience and knowledge of the game that he's really good at navigating a draft and figuring out what are the combos I'm likely to be able to scrape together here and how what's my fallback if this doesn't work. Whereas if I'm coming into a draft and I open up Thespian Stage, I'm like, well, I'm passing a lot of like pretty fair or like pretty reasonable, efficient stuff. Is it worth me? Taking this card, that is a pretty big risk that if I don't get the other half of this combo, it's just not going to do anything, is not going to be as rewarding for me just at the level of skill I'm at. Like, I, I can be very honest about that. Counterpoint, I drafted AI Breddy's Cube at CubeCon. And Shout out to AI Breddy. I just dove in. I was like, you know what? This is, I, I've been drafting a lot. Again, coming back to it matters how often you're doing it to what kind of range of experiences you're willing to tolerate. And I just pack one, pick one Crucible of Worlds and just thought, let me see, let me see if this, I'm trying to do something here. <laughs> and just drafted everything that interacted with lands and I got all the, the combos I wanted. I did lose one match to just a really, really solid, fair Spells Matter deck. But otherwise my deck, kind of worked and did a lot of cool stuff with your favorite card that I'm forgetting. Your Wasteland, favorite your favorite five Red th- and six, your favorite five three, Titania Protector Titania of Argoth. Titania Pro- Protector of Argoth and making Merit Lages. And so yeah, I mean, I feel like that was a moment where I just was willing to really commit and I was I was also emotionally prepared for this might just not work. And yeah, it is a lot of fun when you can have that kind of experience. The highs are high. Which which brings me to one of the last things I wanted to say about combo as it pertains to cube design, which is that for the longest time, I just had my Bun Magic Cube. And as many people know, it started much more similar to like what the Magic Online Vintage Cube looks like now. It was never powered, but I had all of the reanimator decks and mm-hmm. all of the like build arounds like survival of the fittest and living death. I and had show sneak and tell? attack and I never had show and tell, but I had okay. sneak attack and upheaval and what opposition. About, what about Tinker? I never had Tinker either. That was always considered a little too good for me. But I had a lot more like combo oriented things in that cube alongside fair stuff. And for me, for my goals, I was never super happy with how those decks interact with one another. And I spent a long time, you know, pulling my hair out, trying to balance things, right? Like changing the nature of the reanimator targets so that they weren't so unbeatable and making sure there was enough removal in all the colors that they could deal with the reanimated creatures and cutting the other combo decks that I felt like didn't have a suite of interaction that could fit with them. And what ultimately made me totally rip all of the combo with a capital C out of the Bun Magic Cube was when I built the Degenerate Micro Cube. Because now I had these cards I wanted to play, and here's a new place to play them. And it was like a weight was lifted. And I was like, mm-hmm. oh, my cube doesn't have to be everything. Like, I, there's yes. different experiences I want to have with the game. And the one I most often want to have is the Bun Magic Cube experience of drafting a lean, fair deck and playing to these abstract outcomes and these abstract heuristics and making these like savvy plays with limited information that's that's trying to capture the best parts of playing like a constructed legacy, right? But sometimes I also just want to do silly combo stuff. And for me, for my particular proclivities, it was so much better for me to make a whole different cube where yeah. I got to do that. And yeah, for every like one time I drafted a giant micro cube, I probably drafted the button magic cube six to ten times. But that's about the density that I that I want to be doing these different things. And it was really freeing for me to just make another cube. Which is to say, if you're out there and you're also in a place maybe where I was four years ago with the Bun Magic Cube, just like trying to balance these things and constantly being stifled and having drafts where somebody like destroyed everybody with a good reanimator deck and it's like, ah, oh, is reanimator too good? And then four drafts where reanimator never comes together because if it doesn't come together, it's a train wreck. And just feeling like I couldn't get these things into a place where they were balanced, I just put it in the general micro cube yeah. and it was really, really freeing for me. I think we both, and this isn't explicitly about combo, but we sort of both learned this thing about cube design. You through the Bun Magic Cube, your very fair cube, and the Degenerate Micro Cube, your very unfair cube, and me with the regular cube and the Turbo Cube, that it's very it's very important to set expectations correctly to have yeah. a fun experience, and it is very difficult to set expectations correctly when you're trying to do everything at once. So having just multiple cubes often is the answer. And I actually wrote a whole article largely about that, which you can check out on luckypaper.co. A really great article that I think we mentioned once in passing, but we'll say here, semi-mid-roll, that uh, you really should read that article. It's, I think, fantastic. Thank you. It got a lot of... A lot of love from the community, well deserved. So uh, it was a, it was a fun write. I was trying to write like two paragraphs in the Turbo Cube about what the history was, and it was sort of like all this has to come out of me. <laughs> That's the best way to write is when you're like, "Oops, I have a lot to say. I didn't realize I had to yeah. say." And now there's like ten paragraphs on the and page. And unfortunately, I had Parker to edit that and turn it into <laughs> something readable. <laughs> God bless Parker. We all are very grateful for our Parker. You said mid roll. How much more do you have to talk about combo? 
Well, the last thing I want to talk about is just where I'm at right now with the neoclassical cube, because there are definitely combos in that environment, and the combo deck I've had the most fun playing by far, which you will definitely know if you've been watching the YouTube channel at all, and you will know probably just from listening to us mention it in passing on this show, is the like fast bond combo yeah. decks in that cube. So this is a cube where you're trying to emulate largely the feel of old school magic, and I think that combo is just a much bigger part of old school magic. Totally agree. We see so many cards, well, so many just effects that are templated, like do this no more than once a turn, uh, and similar things like that. Everything is strapped to a creature, which means combat matters, so... Magic has changed a lot, and these kind of weird, suddenly, oops, I do all this stuff out of nowhere, and it doesn't really interact on the same axis as what you're doing, doesn't happen as much. Yeah, there's a lot of factors to that, I think. I think one factor is that just individual cards had way less raw power in terms of, like, game-ending That's a good point, impact. Yeah. And so, because of that, you had just way more time, and there was way more forgiveness and leeway in constructed magic in the old-school days to put together something... By modern standards, extremely clunky because sure. you just had more time to like put together these Here are my awkward two pieces. Four mana enchantments, right? So that's that's a big piece of it. I think another part of it is just that R and D back in the day was much simpler and uh, mm -hmm. and less overwrought, and they would just print stuff and it'd be broken, and they'd be like, "Oops, <laughs> we we tried our best." But now there's like so much more play design, and there's like so much more history to learn from, and to say that. It's, it's kind of ironic to say this right now on the wake of the Discover mechanic, which ended up being broken in almost identical ways to the Cascade mechanic. But there's all this history that can theoretically be learned from to prevent these like broken combo things from happening again. I also think just the nature of digital play means that, you know, back in the day, if you had a combo deck that was like lurking around some fairly competitive but mostly casual like meta in a town it was like okay that's the thing that comes up every once in a while whereas now if you go on like magic online you can see the stats of how yeah. much this one deck is dominating the meta and then everyone can go look at those stats and go build that exact same deck in one click the the spread of information and the spread of these maybe less than ideal play patterns and archetypes is just like lightning quick that as compared to like the old days so for all those reasons yeah. i agree i mean the context is just totally different i don't think it's fair to say r&d used to be worse at predicting these things but that i just, didn't say that i said that's just simpler and i'm i'm <laughs> Continuing to not say that, and instead say that there, there were just totally different expectations. You know, now there is a huge competitive scene, and people are yeah playing online and and figuring out the details of every new set so quickly, and that's not what Magic was about originally. It was a game to be played casually. Like the expectations for how people would play Magic was very different, and so yeah, they did a lot of flavorful top-down designs. Here we are in Alurin, and there's all these small creatures that are just have full of energy. They're going crazy. They're going crazy. <laughs> and so we'll just make a top-down design card that kind of reflects that. And Or here's, what what about food chain? We have all these creatures that are evolving into other creatures and things like that. That made sense in that context, where it wasn't about... The way that Magic was played wasn't as much about perfectly optimizing it. And it was cool to have players then dive in and be like, oh, I found this like cool, neat interaction between these cards that would take enough time for that discovery to happen that it felt like a meaningful sort of narrative as a community that things just don't work the same anyway with Magic at the scale that it is. And that's not to say either is worse or better. They're just different things. Yeah, and that exact difference of like culture almost is mm -hmm. what I'm trying to capture with this cube, right? Like... I want you to be able to put together a kind of clunky combo deck because your opponent's aggro decks are not going to be killing you so fast that it's not possible. And I think it's going to be hard for me to like find the balance where that's possible but not broken. We did a roto draft of this cube a while back, and I managed to put together like a truly broken fast bond deck mm -hmm. in a roto context because it was a roto draft. There were a lot of cards I really wanted that no one else wanted. I started off by taking fast bond and two draw sevens, and it was like, okay, I did it. I can win please, with a ham sandwich now. Please don't now. take all of my bounce lands from me in one fell swoop. Right. That was that was my biggest concern at that point. Was like, am I going to get as many of these Ravnica bounce lands as I want now for this like the fair side of the fast bond combo? Yeah, it was kind of messed up, and I got some questions on YouTube and on you know the Discord and stuff of like people, what kind of questions? Questions like is this what you have to do to have success in this environment? Like, yeah. is this what this cube is about? Like, I see this broken deck. Is that what this cube is about? And my answer is, like, I want it to be about this every once in a while, but no. Like, I I don't want it to be, like... It's almost like I want to cultivate a cube that the way it's designed makes people want to draft it in a less optimized way. To play it the way that Magic used to mm -hmm. be played, where it wasn't like you're making all these optimal decisions, but it was like... I'm going to try and do this thing, and maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, and like that's part of the fun of it. And Which almost, to me, makes it feel like it's a little bit less suited to a rotisserie draft than a lot of the other cubes that we play. 
Um, I mean, I had a great time <laughs> with, with, with my deck, so I'm not prepared to say uh, I wasn't well suited for it. I did lose one match. That, oh, uh, that's that got to be frustrating. It was only frustrating because like I've never gone undefeated. Lost. It was only frustrating because you lost. Well, no, if you had like won, it wouldn't have been frustrating. Like, I, I at wasn't. All. I wasn't mad at like the loss. It was just like your the, opponent winning. No, 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 no. <laughs> shut up. Shut that. Shut up. <laughs> it was just that. Going undefeated in a rotisserie draft would be so cool, and I feel like it's going to be... It's such a hard task. You didn't say a different thing. <laughs> no, I'm just saying that, like, I had a chance, right? Like, if you ever rotisserie draft this cube ever again, I've now... I didn't even know how good this deck was going to be going in. I was like, well, I, this is what I want to do. I've been having so much fun with Fast Bond. Let's see how good a Fast Bond deck can get. And it ended up being pretty broken. And then just by, a, like, you know, mostly kind of variants, I, like, drew a couple too many lands. I was playing against a reanimator deck that was... Could threaten a very quick win, which was part of why I, I didn't win that match, is because when I did stumble, I stumbled and they had an Acroma in play, as opposed to I stumbled and Ooh. they played some, you know, two twos, which I could ignore for three more turns. But I don't know. It would have been cool to go undefeated in order to see drafts. And I feel like that was as close as I'm. It's definitely as close as I've ever been, and we'll see when it happens again. But it seems like a really. I don't think there's been any rotisserie draft. Anyone's actually truly gone undefeated in and played all their matches. I think Zach would have gone undefeated in the Bun Magic Roto draft, but he didn't play one match, uh, and he, he probably would have won that one just based I'm, on. I'm going to give that of, to him. Yeah, I mean, he did literally go undefeated in that he didn't lose, but he also didn't play all his matches. Anyway, I had a lot of fun. Does it make that cube good for Roto drafting? I don't know. Maybe not. I think the matches were way swingier at in a rotisserie draft of that cube. Not just mine, but like even the other matchups I saw people playing were like way swingier than they would be in the regular cube or the Bun Magic cube because yeah the peaks of these particular combos or synergies are way higher if you can make them happen. And that's part of what I'm trying to cultivate with that environment. I want combo to be a thing, but not the only thing because, you know, old school magic was combos were definitely more prevalent, but also sly was like the deck that was there to check them all. Right. Like, uh, are you familiar with the pro bloom or pros bloom combo deck from the early days of magic played by Mike long. It's like one of the iconic, does earliest have, does it have summer bloom and no it has a uh, cadaverous bloom is the bloom in question Cadaver that okay that's a new card for me it has cadaverous bloom and squandered resources cadaverous bloom is a five mana enchantment that says you can exile a land from your hand to make two mana and squandered resources is you can sacrifice a land to make a mana and so it just played cadaverous bloom and squandered resources and a bunch of big draw spells and eventually a drain life and the idea is that you could you know, brain geyser yourself enough with all of these extra cards to then draw more cards to then brain geyser yourself again and eventually just win with a giant drain life. And that's a, like one of the earliest dominant combo decks like back there with like Channel Fireball, right? Back when Magic started to become a little bit more structured, they added the four card limit, you know, things like that. And my understanding of the history is that like, yeah, that deck was really dominant. And then like Sly came along and was like, now you don't have time to wait to cast a five mana enchantment. Mm -hmm. You're just going to be dead, which totally changed the texture of the game. And, like, I'm just trying to capture that, like, vibe. But I think I've done an okay job so far. But, like, the most of my thinking around the neoclassical cube and my, like, hemming and hawing around changes comes around how to bring these things into balance. Because the questions I got of, like, oh, do you have to do unfair stuff in this cube to be successful? Like, I, I don't want that to be the answer. No, I want it to be a thing that you can do sometimes, but I don't want it to happen all the time. And maybe I've leaned a little bit too far into the unfair stuff and I got to bring it back a little, but... We'll see. I mean, I think it's so difficult because a lot of what you're trying to optimize for is this kind of unoptimized experience of there still being irregularities and variations and surprises and interesting sort of challenges. And it's it's hard to optimize towards that kind of experience. Yeah. It's certainly easier to optimize for the, like, very black and white goals of the Bun Magic Cube or the right. Degenerate Micro Cube. And this is a little more nebulous but i still think it's possible right like i think it's possible to make card choices with the goal of creating an environment where people don't want to do the optimal thing they want to do these like ambitious right. things and an environment where people expect that their deck is going to be clunky right like it's part of the appeal of the old school cards for me is that like everything's a little clunky like you know yeah like you, you're like i'm gonna attack you with the squee that i hard cast now like that's what my deck is doing at this point point. Yeah. and that's not like you failed and are like absolutely bombing. That's like, yeah, sometimes the games come down to this like clunky nonsense because everyone's cards are kind of bad. You, like nobody's just going to play a three mana four, four that just doesn't happen. Yeah. I, you know, I haven't, okay, there this... is arrogant worm and reckless worm. That's kind of a three mana four, four, but you get the point. Sure. 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 
I haven't made this parallel before, but the way you're describing this now, it does sound a lot like my ear regular cube, which was yeah. in contrast to regular cube. I, I kind of felt like, yeah, we've optimized regular cube a lot. We've like taken out a lot of the power outliers on both ends, the things that were a little bit underpowered, the things that were overpowered. And it's the gameplay is a lot better, but we don't have those like really splashy moments of like, look at this cool deck I drafted anymore yeah. to the same degree in the same way. So I did want to try, you know, adding in these overpowered rare cards that you get occasionally in. Oh, look, here. Here's, everybody's all my cards are kind of bad but I drafted recurring nightmare now I can do this like weird wacky stuff and play recurring nightmare with cards that you otherwise never would see it with because it's yep. usually played at a certain power level or here's this conspiracy I did a weird thing with or all kinds of other things like that so it, it was very much a similar even though it is a very different implementation the goal of let's try and capture some of these more rough edges and these irregularities and this fun kind of kitchen tableness of it was very much the goal so it's it's funny how much we have actually just gone on similar yeah. cube design experiences no, i think so for sure yeah and i mean like one simple design choice for example is that the butt magic cube has always been and i think will always be 360 cards i really love designing cubes where there's like no where you're designing for the card pool you want everyone to draft, and you're drafting the entire card pool every time. But immediately with the neoclassical cube, I was like, that feels wrong. Like, mm-hmm. I just want there to be more variance in this. And so the cube is just an arbitrary size bigger than 360. And that is very much suited to the, like, this is not an environment where you should sit down and necessarily, like, try and mega optimize because you might open the fast bond and then, yeah. well, that's a bad example, but you might open the fast <laughs> bond and no draw sevens, right? And that's really where the fast bond pops right. off. Or you might open, you know, the uh, parallax wave and not the. Aromancer. Let's go the other direction. You might open the Aromancer, but not the Parallax. Parallax wave is always good, but you might open the Aromancer, but not the Parallax wave. And so it's like you just can't always try and do these, like, you know, prescriptive best things. You have to, like, string some weird nonsense together. I think it's worth highlighting that because that's usually counter to the advice that I see people give about cube design, which is that people will say, if you have a cube with combos, keep it to 360 or whatever size is right to be fully drafted by your play group. People meeting the professor? No, I, I see most people, This is I see this pretty consistently, that people say, well, you don't want to fall into those traps. You don't want to have people draft one half of the combo and not see the other, so keep it tight so the full combo is always there. But I appreciate that other perspective that actually that variance has value as well. And so sometimes it's worth not doing that. And if you have an environment with combos, maybe you don't want it to be about that every single time. Yeah, I'm trying to punish a little bit. The like super spiky, I'm going to like draft the best thing no matter what. It's like, well, you can't. Like so maybe you just get open the pieces and be wrong. And somebody else that was just like, I like this card. It's cool. Now it's a better deck than you. you know? Yeah. And so, I mean, I think it's just worth being deliberate either way. I don't think there's, there's a correct way to approach that. But there are differences. Different things are different things. And on that bombshell, <laughs> that's the end of this episode of Lucky Paper Radio. Can we just say uh, Spotify just did their end of year thing and a bunch of people were posting oh, yes. in all kinds of discords that and Twitter and whatnot. Lucky Paper Radio was their number one podcast. And I feel like a lot of times I want to like say thank you to broad broadly to people that maybe uh, I don't have time to respond to individually. But this is a case where I actually can respond to each. I know all of you are listening to this. So uh, <laughs> thank you to all of you. That really, I think, made both of us feel like really validated in spending a lot of time on this podcast. And for those of you in the 5,000 hour club that listened to more than 5,000 hours of this yeah, podcast. Also, 5,000 minutes, not 5,000 hours. That would make no sense. Enjoy other things, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm always really touched people like this show. I mean, that's why we make the show, right? Like... The fact that there are people out there that love listening to it, that's why we do this, yeah. because uh, otherwise it wouldn't be any fun, and also we make no money doing it. So uh, there are so many shows that are important to me, and I love that this show is important to some of you, and I'm really grateful for all people that posted that. It does mean a lot. Just from Spotify alone, there were 365 people that listened to our show more than any other podcast, and as you alluded wow. to, my first response on Twitter was like, if you'd like some better podcast recommendations, <laughs> like, I, I really love podcasts. All right, give them. What do you what do you recommend before you listen to Lucky Paper Radio? What should people listen to? Well, Buenta Vista <laughs> is a mainstay this is, recommendation. This is, this is the part of the podcast where we try and get you to stop listening to our podcast. Uh, Buenta Vista is a mainstay recommendation of, yes. of mine that has, we've talked about in this podcast before many times. I think it is one of the best silly podcasts about nothing, which is my favorite style of podcast that is currently being made. So if you'd like to hear some charming and funny and intelligent people talk about some nonsense, you can check out Bunta Vista. Also throw a recommendation in here for, well, there is your problem. This is yeah. a engineering disasters podcast hosted by these two Philadelphia-based engineers, which I grew up in the Philadelphia area, and 
there is something very like nostalgic and like feels like home about those two guys to me. Their accents, the like references they make, they definitely a Philadelphia vibe. And then also uh, a British woman who is not an engineer but is a uh, a train enthusiast and a, and a leftist. <laughs> train- <laughs> yeah, fair. And uh, it's it's a it's a fantastic podcast if you are interested in like. I'm not an engineer. I, mean, I guess I'm a software engineer, but I'm not a like it's mechanical engineer thing. in any sense. Uh, and I went to art school, so you know I don't actually know any of these things. But it's really fascinating for me to hear about how, how much better have trains gone are than other things. <laughs> yeah, like like it, they go into great detail to describe exactly in engineering terms like what goes wrong in these situations, and then having this like really valuable like leftist political perspective, which is that. Almost all of these engineering disasters are attributable to somebody just trying to cut a corner to save some money yep. and like not being willing to follow safety procedures or hire an extra person for whatever because it costs more money. It's like a very comprehensive and uh, also humorous view on how the world works and why it works the way that it does. Yeah, I've been enjoying that as well. It did take me a, a minute to get used to their vibe. It's it's a different vibe. Liam is a character you got to get used to. Mm-hmm. He's he. I think he intentionally is very... Uh, bristly and doesn't want to be liked and so at first you don't like him but then you know, he was <laughs> it some works more, and it becomes a little more appealing i'll throw one other dumb recommendation in here for a okay. show i haven't recommended before we're you know a couple weeks after uh thanksgiving here and i know i listen to every year the podcast till death do us blart mm-hmm. and you asked me this year if i listen to it so i, I take it you've also taken up the uh the death blart Yes, I, one one day maybe we'll watch this movie together that I, neither of us have seen. I kind of want to, and I think it'd be such a weird experience now. There's a podcast made by these two Australian gentlemen called The Worst Idea of All Time, which I haven't listened to in a long time, and my understanding is they have like tweaked and modified the idea. But originally, the idea of the podcast was every calendar year, they would choose a movie, usually a kind of awful movie, and they would watch it every single week, and every single week would release a podcast reviewing the same movie like a weird twisted take on the movie review podcast genre, which is so popular. And till death to us, Blart is a collaboration between them and another podcast where they every year on Thanksgiving, watch Paul Blart mall cop two, and then have a podcast talking about it. And they has, and they have, as the name of the podcast implies pledge to do this until their deaths. And then have nominated people to take up the, standard in their absence when they do eventually pass on so a very stupid podcast but i i love having that to look forward to every year when we're driving on thanksgiving so uh, maybe listen to this year's till death do us blart if you if that sounds fun to you and then next thanksgiving you'll subscribe to the feed and you'll forget about it and next thanksgiving it'll, it'll pop, pop up, up and you'll oh, be yeah. like oh right this is dumb yeah i was thinking about it a couple weeks before thanksgiving and then forgot about it and then it popped up and i was like oh yeah that is what i'm gonna do this morning <laughs> Okay, one of the dumb recommendations. Okay. I just can't help it. Uh, the neighborhood listen. That's exactly what I was going to say. You do it. You do it then. I mean, if you like, if you like to laugh, <laughs> go listen to this podcast. I think it's hilarious. Yeah, I don't. I don't have any specific. It's pitch. a well. We can describe it briefly. It's a. It's an improv podcast with Paul F. Tompkins and Nicole Parker, and they play these two like neighborhood busybodies. And the format of the show is it's an improv show, but all of the spark the like inspiration for their improvs are actual posts from next door they don't say next door because they don't want to yes they don't want to say the name oh of the it's website. next door i had no idea <laughs> they, they, they say from a popular neighborhood website uh but so people send in actual like unhinged ridiculous posts from next door and then they have other comedians come on and play characters that have posted these things and they play these busybody characters that you come to love over time they were on hiatus for a long time and then they were behind a paywall for a long time but the new season came out just uh the end of october and they've been releasing weekly since so they also have there's a third character doug the engineer who's just this kind of like he's a really important foil to the much more sort of exuberant (laughs) personalities he's just kind of a dopey guy but always sort of sets things off balance in such a funny way i would would you even go would you say start at the beginning and listen chronologically? Because there is this like weird character development arc. Like, I think it'd be funny if you just go pick any random episode, but yeah, I liked listening to it chronologically. I can't, I feel like some people are like chronological listen people Mm -hmm. and I just never have been the shows that I have come to love. I actually end up just listening to reverse chronologically and catching up all the way to the beginning. I never go back to the beginning and start, which that's unhinged to some people because they're like, you're just hearing all the references. It It depends. But I think that this is a case where there is some, subtle character development and like background plot development that I think is valuable. I do think the show's gotten better over time. So what I would say is listen to a recent episode. <laughs> the recent one and then and be if like, you like it, why was that 
happening. If, you, if it seems like your thing, maybe go back and start at the beginning and actually uh, pick it up. Because it does have c- continuity and these yeah. characters build over time in a way that's pretty interesting. So, all right. For you 365 Spotify listeners, and if the statistics hold true, another like 500-ish people that are not on Spotify that listen to our podcast more than any other podcast... There are some recommendations of some potentially better podcasts for you to listen to. <laughs> so enjoy. That's it for this episode. And what of... we mean to say is thank you. <laughs> yes, and also thank you. That's it for this episode of Lucky Paper Radio. All of our music is produced by DJ James Nasty. All the magic cards are produced by Wizards of the Coast. This podcast is produced by Anthony and I doing a combo where I'm part A and I get into the podcast and get on a mic and he's part B and then by combined we are greater than the sum of our parts and win the game immediately loose it's a loose metaphor